toe into Revelation 12, knowing that Revelation 12 is but an extension of the sixth seal. So, Revelation 12 is the detail of those last six verses of chapter 6. We put our toe in, just opened it up. Today, we're going to jump into Revelation 12, two feet and all. So, there's a lot of material to work through. I'll endeavour to go as good a pace as we can so you can absorb as much as you can. If you find it a little bit overwhelming, which some of us will, then just try to take in as much as you can knowing that you can get the CDs or look at the slides if you so desire a little later on. Well, brothers and sisters, yesterday we finished off, well, we touched on the fifth seal. And we talked about our brothers and sisters who cried unto God and they cried, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on those that dwell upon the earth? We made the point that they called God a despot. Despot is the only time the word is used. Now somebody asked me the question, what is a despot? Well, a despot is an absolute ruler. One who will brook no rival. So there was God called the absolute ruler, brooking no rival in contrast to the Diocletian in the world who also saw himself as an absolute ruler and would brook no rival. That's the reason I believe that that word only used in that place is to show that God was the true absolute ruler in contrast to Diocletian. When they cried how long, the answer came. In measure, when Constantine swept from York in Britain, having been made the Caesar by his men, he came down and eight miles out from Rome at Milvian Bridge, he defeated Maxentius in the greatest battle of Constantine's life. And therefore, Constantine came into Rome and he then became the Emperor of the West. He is still going to deal with the East, which we will cover in our study this morning. But in eight In AD 313, he then got together with his brother-in-law Licinius and they drafted the Edict of Milan and answered in measure, how long? And God said, there is relief on the way. And then yesterday, as we put our toe in to Revelation 12, which is the sixth seal, the first great earthquake, we said that one of the major platforms or players in this drama is the pagan Roman Empire, the great dragon. And we, I think, many of us went through and coloured all those in in red because that has specific reference to the pagan empire. We also put in the mouth of the great red dragon three emperors, Galerius, Maxentius and Licinius, who would play their particular role historically in this chapter 12. Now we're going to see how that pans out this morning as we look at that in a much more detailed manner. We also said, brothers and sisters, the other player, the other contender for this battle of supremacy, who will be in control of the Roman world? Well, the other contender would be Michael. Her child, the man-child, And her child mentioned there again in verse 4. Mike Ale, and in the Greek we understand the word to mean he who like God. He is Constantine as we will prove this morning as we go through our studies. Now you can see brothers and sisters, the Greek is ho Michael. Literally, Constantine is the Michael. He is the He who, like God, in other words, he is the Mike Ale of this situation. It's not Christ. Christ is the greater Mike Ale. But he, Constantine, in this instance, is going to be used as a vessel. As God used Alexander, as God used Cyrus, as God used Napoleon, and raised them up as vessels to accomplish his work. And Michael Constantine is going to do a work for God in this instance to cast out the pagan Roman Empire. I want you to note this as we are just passing through. 
Note verse 5. She, and I'm going to talk more about the woman in a moment, so don't despair, we're going to cover her in a a great amount of detail. Uh, In verse 5 says, She, this woman, brought forth the man-child, Constantine, who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron, and her child was caught up. Now, as we have on the screen, the word caught up in the Greek means to be lifted up forcibly. And we're going to see that the battles of force by Constantine and his army allowed the inevitability of Constantine being lifted up, elevated into the great heights and people would see him as God's representative as you will see as we go through. All right, brothers and sisters, now having a look now at this verse, we're now going to drill into this chapter and start to expand Now, remember we said, didn't we, yesterday that we've got a chapter now that has two dragons. We have a chapter before us that has three women. We need to know how the dragons become two, why they become two, when they become two, and we need to know how these women become three. Now, let's start with looking at verse 4. Verse 4 of Revelation 12, we read this, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. A third part? Oh, yesterday we talked about there being six emperors after Diocletian abdicated in 305 AD. There were six. The sixth one is not up there on the, on the chart. But we had Constantius who died. We had Galerius who wanted to do Constantius in. But of course, Constantius died and Constantine took his place. Galerius wanted to therefore defeat and destroy Constantine, but then Galerius died, and then we had four. And then Constantine Constantine defeated Maxentius, and then we have three. So that's the setting of the scene, you see. We've now got three emperors. Therefore, his tail, whoever that is, which we'll explore in a moment, his tail drew the third part. Third, three emperors, and they needed to be there in order to fulfil, in measure, this particular verse. Alrighty, his tail, the pagan dragon's tail, whoever that is for the moment, drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, brothers and sisters, verse 4 is one of those verses that's reversed. In chapter 12, not only do we have the challenge of two dragons and three women, but we have verses that give you an upfront picture, then take you back and show you how you got there. And some of the verses do not run chronologically. Here is a classic example. Let's just explore that for the moment. When we come to verse 4, we read, The dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child, Constantine, as soon as he was born. Now, brothers and sisters, you could literally place Galerius and Maxentius in that verse because they are, in this instance, the dragon that stood before the woman. And the woman, just by the way, we're going to come to her in a moment, is the truth gone bad. The woman, in this instance, is the apostasy, the emerging Catholic Church who would champion Constantine and then Constantine would lift up the church and give her the status of political supremacy and make her the state religion. So, in the first instance, Galerius did want to destroy Constantine before he was born. Brothers and sisters, Constantine was politically born in 312 AD. When the Senate, when Constantine came in and defeated Maxentius, the Senate lifted Constantine up and made Constantine the chief of the three then emperors in the empire. So Constantine was politically born in 312. Before he defeated Maxentius, Constantine was in the womb of his mother. And when Constantine was born, he didn't really at that stage in 312 really know who his mother was. There were all these different religious sects The Catholic sect existed among other sects. And it wasn't until three years later, after 312, that Constantine began to realise who really was his mother 
and who really he was going to lift up. More about that in a moment. But before he's born politically in 312, Galerius tried to eat him and Maxentius tried to eat him. Therefore, you can put those two names right in that verse because they are the two emperors representing the pagan Roman Empire at that time, ready to eat the man-child before 312. Well, brothers and sisters, we read in verse 4 of Revelation 12, and his tail. Now, we're going to go back to the first part of that verse. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Whose tail? Well, let's look at the lie of the land, shall we, with respect to Constantine now having just been born. There, brothers and sisters, is the lie of the land. Just 312. And what we have is Constantine has taken this portion. He is emperor of the West. He's been born. The Senate has elevated him. Over here, we have Licinius, who has that portion of the territory of the pagan section of the empire. Now, Licinius at this stage is relatively pro-Christian. He's going to change. We have over here the territory occupied by the third of the emperors, Maximin, who was absolutely a hater of the Christians and was pro-pagan. Now, what happens, brothers and sisters? His tail. Who is the his tail? Can't be Constantine because he's not pagan. It's either Licinius or Maximin. What happened? Well, brothers and sisters, Licinius is there starting to turn. And he looks over there and he sees his brother-in-law and he sees the big swag of territory that he's got. And Licinius says, you know, I wouldn't mind that. And Licinius looks down here to the territory that Maximin had and Licinius says, you know, I wouldn't mind that also. And Maximin down here looks up to Licinius and says, hmm, I wouldn't mind that territory. And therefore, Maximin starts a push to, to, to go to war with Licinius. And Maximin provokes Licinius and Licinius swings back and with, he's now turning, Licinius is now turning pagan and with his tail, he gobbles up one third of the empire. He draws the third of the stars and casts them to the earth. Now Licinius has got two thirds of the empire. Now that is one sense in which historically the tail draws the third part of the stars of heaven. But there's another sense that I'm going to share with you in a moment. So what happens now, brothers and sisters, is now we've got two. So let's get rid of Maximin. He now goes with the others, Galerius and Constantius. We've now got two contenders in this battle for Rome or this supremacy. And therefore, the battle lines are drawn. And the battle lines are drawn there. We have now the pagan dragon, Licinius, who is about now to contend with Constantine, the champion of the woman, the so-called Christian emperor, which he wasn't at all, brothers and sisters, but history testifies that he was, which he wasn't. So therefore, we read Revelation 12, and there was war in the political heavens of Rome. Not one war, it was a series of battles that would take place over 12 years from AD 312 to AD 324. So over those 12 years, there would be these battles between these men until finally Constantine, the man-child, would wrest the empire to himself. Therefore, there was war in the political heavens of Rome. Constantine and his army, now literally now we read this, fought against Licinius, and Licinius fought with his army. And Licinius, the great dragon, was cast out, that old serpent. Now, I want you to be careful here. Here is another way in which the drawing of the tail and the casting of the stars to the earth took place. What happened with these wars? Constantine, brothers and sisters, was getting sick to death of his brother-in-law. He was sick to death of him. And Constantine said, now listen, behave yourself. Stop making these wars. And Constantine therefore relegated a third of the empire to Licinius. And Constantine said to his brother-in-law, now listen, behave yourself. Every time we go to battle, I'm supreme. Now behave yourself. Get over in that paddock like a good horse and stay behind your fence. 
and he put him into one third of this territory. Ah, now here is where this verse, verse 4, is also fulfilled, whereby once again Licinius is going to draw the tail and cast a third of the stars to heaven. Because what he's going to do, brothers and sisters, he's going to now go through this one third and he's going to loot and pillage the churches, the woman. And when he goes through and pillages the churches, he gets money and he's going to drum up an army and he's going to have a final battle with his brother-in-law, Constantine. Now, I want you to read with me, if you will, these verses. Now, we've got to be very careful we don't trip over these verses in Revelation 12. I want you to note verse 8, based on what we just said, albeit very quickly, but let's have a look at Revelation 12 and read these words. So, we really get our head around what this is saying. Revelation 12, reading verse 8 and 9. Well, there was war in heaven, verse 7, and Constantine fought against Licinius. Now we've got verse 8. Oh, no, we better read verse 7, otherwise we're not going to get the connecting link. Verse 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels, Constantine, fought against Licinius, and Licinius fought in his army. And Licinius, verse 8, prevailed not. Neither was there place found any more in the political heavens. Licinius, get over there in that one third and behave yourself. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we read in verse 9, And the great dragon, Licinius, was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He, Licinius, in verse 9, was cast out to the earth, and his army was cast out with him. Now look, he was cast out, brothers and sisters, was Licinius, but he wasn't obliterated. He wasn't annihilated. He was just cast out. Get over there in that one third and behave yourself. He's still around. He's still thrashing. How do we know? Well, let's read verse 12 and 13. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens. Why are we rejoicing? Well, we're rejoicing because Constantine is defeating. Constantly he is defeating the pagan dragon. So people are happy. Licinius is not going to get the ascendancy. Our champion, the man-child, is. Rejoice, ye heavens. We're going to look at that in a bit more detail in a moment. Rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell upon them. But woe. Now listen to this. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for Licinius is come down unto you. There he is. He's been put in his place over here, but he's still going, you see. He's coming, and in verse 12, Licinius has got great wrath, because Licinius knows that he's got a short time. You bet you have. You've only gotten to AD 324, Licinius, and you're gone. Verse 13, And when Licinius saw, there he is, he's here, exiled to that one third by Constantine. When Licinius saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman. He went through there, as we've said, and he went through looting and pillaging the churches of the woman in order that he might drum up an army and defeat, he thought, finally, his brother-in-law. And therefore, brethren and sisters, the battle lines are drawn and this would be the last battle of this pagan dragon with Constantine. And this is what Licinius would say. He would address his men before he went into battle with Constantine. Friends and fellow warriors, said Licinius, as he assembled ready for the final battle, these are the gods of our ancestors and he dresses these gods all around them in this grove. These are the gods of our ancestors whom received from our earliest predecessors as objects of worship we honour. But he who commands the army that is drawn up against us, that is Constantine, having adopted an atheistic opinion, calls his brother an atheist. I'm sure Constantine would have appreciated that. He violates the customs, does Constantine, of the fathers. Constantine venerates a god from abroad. I know not whence, says Licinius, and Constantine disgraces his troops with his ignominious standard, the cross. The first two letters of the name of Jesus Christ in Greek, XP, as the Romans marched with that banner. Trusting is Constantine in which he arms not so much against us as against the gods whom he offends. Now, Licinius then says this. 
If the foreign god, that is the god of Constantine, whom we now deride, should appear the mightiest, then we must acknowledge and honour him, said Licinius, and bid farewell to these pagan gods to whom we have vainly lit candles. Wax tapers. So off Licinius went to war, his final battle. And the result? You look at the angels at work, brothers and sisters. The result? There's a coin of Constantine. There's his name. There's the ignominious standard with, with which he marched. And there is a serpent under that ignominious standard. And Constantine's letter to Eusebius after the defeat of his brother-in-law, Licinius the dragon, Constantine says this, quoting Revelation 12, that dragon, having been deposed from the governance of affairs by God's providence, but now that liberty is restored and that dragon driven from the administration of public affairs by the providence of the supreme deity and, by the way, our instrumentality, says Constantine, we trust that all can see the efficacy of the divine power. What an amazing thing. Well, what was the response of the Christians? The Christians said this, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Brothers and sisters, here were the false Christians, here was the Catholic system saying the kingdom of God is on earth. How bad they had fallen from the truth, believing that he, he, Constantine, had brought in the kingdom of God and therefore they rejoiced with the victory over paganism. That's what the Christians were saying, the Christian so-called, the apostasy. Well, what were the pagans saying about this defeat? Well, Revelation 6 and verse 16 through 17, they weren't saying, salvation and glory and the kingdom of God. They were saying, Run, run, hide us from the face of him, Constantine, that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? And be very careful when you read those verses, brothers and sisters. This is not the coming of Christ in our day. This is what they believed in their day in those early years of those centuries. Well, have a look at this to cement these things with respect to Revelation 12. Lactanius wrote, Let us celebrate the triumph of God with the overthrow of paganism with gladness. Let us commemorate his victory with praise. Let us make mention in our prayers day and night of the peace which after the ten years, after Constantine was lifted up, born of persecution and God has conferred peace upon his people. What a shocking thing, brothers and sisters. Our Lord Jesus Christ looked down from heaven Our Heavenly Father looked down from heaven and saw the apostasy growing in all of its ugliness and heard these words of acclamation that were wrong. But God was using them in his purpose. Well, now we have brothers and sisters, the dragon is now Christian. Constantine has defeated the pagan dragon in AD 324. Enter the Christian dragon. Michael the man-child who now becomes a persecutor of the brothers and sisters and anyone who would challenge the fledging state apostate Catholic Church. Now, some of you coloured that in yesterday. You've got the slides. You can continue that colouring in process. You think we're stretching this? You think we're stretching the fact that there is now a different dragon, a Christian dragon? You have a look at what Gibbon says with respect to now the shift from paganism to Christianity. This is what Gibbon says. The Edict of Milan, 313, the great charter of toleration, had confirmed to each individual of the Roman world the privilege of choosing and professing his own religion. But this inestimable privilege was soon violated. With the knowledge of the truth, in inverted commas, with the knowledge of truth, the emperor, Constantine, imbibed the maxims of persecution and the sects which dissented from the Catholic Church were afflicted and oppressed by the triumph of the Christian dragon. What an astounding thing, brothers and sisters. Well, enter the woman. 
Having looked at the two dragons, now let's see how the woman plays a major role in this 12th chapter. And we made the point that there are three. Now, what I want to do, how are you doing anyway out there? How are you going? How's the coffee? Is it kicked in? Sugar working well? Nobody nodding off? Let me have a good look at you. It's a few waves, so there's some life left in the audience. All right. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to just paint an overview, first of all, of the woman and just go back for a few moments and have a look at the detail and see how it plays in to Constantine who defeats the pagan dragon Licinius. All righty, now, with respect to the woman, we read this. There is the fledging Catholic Church, the state religion that Constantine would raise up and clothe with the sun and she would become the state religion. Now, I've coloured her in brown. So, wherever you see those colours there, this is the Catholic Church as she grows. All right? So, there she is in verse 1 and 2. This is the apostasy. This is the truth gone bad. There she is in verse 4. There she is in verse 4 as her. She's there in verse 5. And there she is in verse 13, when Licinius went through looting the churches, getting the money, he was then persecuting the apostate woman before his death throes, you see. But when this Catholic woman is elevated by her child, her champion, when he finally finds out who his mum is, I mean, you ask any baby that's just been born and they're a month old, who's your mum? I'm not going to tell you she is. And Constantine, when he was born in 312, didn't really know his mum yet. It took him three years. This person, this group of of, uh, Christians were coming to him with this issue and this group were coming to Constantine with this issue and Constantine's listening to them saying, well, you're you're all at each other's throats. Who is the one that I'm going to support? And three years after he was born in 312, he said, ah, the Catholic sect is the one that I'm going to run with. You others, shape up or ship out. So here we now have a woman who ships out because she wasn't going to shape up to the Catholics. So what we see now is there's another woman, a religious group, who are now going to peel away and they're going to flee into the wilderness or they're going to be in exile in a wilderness state. And this is the woman here, a second woman in Revelation 12. So you see in verse 6, And a woman, not this woman, this woman in brown's not fleeing, she's going nowhere. She's got the sun, thank you very much. She's right there with Constantine, revelling in political activity. This woman that peels off is another woman. Verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there 1,203 score years. as a day for a year principle. She's going to run away for 1,260 years. Now, what you need to do, brothers and sisters, and here again, up front picture, and you swept back to see the detail. What you need to do with verse 6 to have a continuity of the story, you need to put verse 6 right before verse 14. Right? Because we're told about a woman running away and then we're given all this detail, detail about the war in heaven. So, verse 6, to follow the continuity of the story, you jump from the end of verse 6 and pick it up. There she is. And to the woman, there were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. Ah, but there's not just two women. More about them in a minute. There are three. You see there? And the dragon, we'll look at that in a moment, The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. The remnant of her seed are the brothers and sisters in Christ who ran with this religious woman who was running away. Now, let me simplify it if I might. In brown, the Catholic Church. In green, the Protestants. In yellow, the saints. Three women. And as far as Constantine and the Catholic Church were concerned, our brothers and sisters who are the remnant of the seed 
were as much a heretic as were the protesting woman or the Protestants. They were all bunched up in their own eyes anyway. Now let's see this in detail. Catholic system, a fleeing protesting woman and our brothers and sisters were part of those who would run away from this Catholic church because Constantine said, you believe what I have edicted. You believe what I have sent out. If you don't, I'm going to persecute you. And so they had to flee. And so therefore, brothers and sisters, let's now just for a few moments have a look at this apostate woman and why, why a group of protesters fled from her and why our brothers and sisters were among those who fled. This is old ground for some, but having had discussions with brothers and sisters, I need to go over this for a few moments. So those who have been down this road a hundred times, just bear with us, check out for 50 if you want to and come back later when we're on ground that perhaps you haven't heard. She being with child, this is the, the apostate system, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. Well, brothers and sisters, we know the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. She's not a virgin. She's pregnant. She's about to give birth to it. She's committed spiritual fornication. And Paul says, I'm worried about you. Way, way, way back there in the first century. And I'm worried that as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds will be corrupted from the simplicity in Christ. Paul, you've got very good reason to be worried. Because, brothers and sisters, not only so in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11 did he say this, but in 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul said similar words for the mystery of of iniquity is already at work in his day, ready to manifest itself in the birth of a child. And therefore, many of us would be aware that from conception to birth, medically, the time of confinement is 40 weeks. That's the medical time of gestation. 40 weeks. And 40 weeks, brothers and sisters, is 280 days. And on a day for a year principle, that's 280 years. Paul said, you can't see it, but I can see the secret lawlessness bubbling under the surface in the first century ecclesia. And like a woman who was expecting, you don't know she's expecting until months roll by. She doesn't even know necessarily that she's expecting a child in the first few weeks. She may not know. Paul says it started. When did it start, brothers and sisters? The secret mystery of lawlessness began when the ecclesia was formed in AD 33. The seed of corruption was planted right then and it would take 280 years later, the time of gestation, when a man-child would be born. What an amazing thing. Well, brothers and sisters, she's going to be elevated by Constantine. She's going to be given the sun and she's going to be given the moon under her feet and there's going to be a group that are going to run away from her the Protestants and our brothers and sisters. She's going to be given this apostate church the garland of 12 stars. We know what that means because when John received this revelation, there had been exactly, exactly 12 emperors up till Domitian. Exactly 12 emperors. She's going to wear the victory crown, you see. And if you think we're stretching that, brothers and sisters, you need to get hold of this book called The Twelve Caesars, a book written about the twelve emperors. There must have been something substantially interesting about them. God says she's going to wear a victory. I have conquered paganism and look at my coronal wreath. It's the twelve emperors that had existed up until the time of John. And you read in that book that under their rule, Rome was transformed from a republic to an empire whose model of regal autocracy would survive the West for more than a thousand years. Well, she would be clothed with the sun. And we've only got to to go to Psalm 89 and verse 36 and this is a symbol of political authority. She was going to join with Constantine Wobbs' church in politics. We have nothing to do with politics, brothers and sisters, and nor should we, ever, until Christ returns. And she would have the moon under her feet. She would become the state religion, unlike Revelation 6, where paganism was turned to blood. This would come to life, you see. But she was premature. This woman, 2,000 years ago, this Catholic system was grasping at political 
supremacy and she was 2,000 years premature. Because brothers and sisters, in Revelation 4 and verse 1, the Lord Jesus Christ walks through a door and turns around and invites you and me to come up into heaven. That's Revelation 4 and verse 1. We're going to be invited when Christ returns to come up into the political heavens of the world. And when you go to Revelation 19 verse 17, what do you read? You read, and I saw an angel standing in the sun. That's you and me. That's you and me in Revelation 19 verse 17. We're going to be the angels standing in the sun. How can we do that? How can we stand in the political glory of the world? Only because Jesus Christ has invited us. Not the man, child. Not the man who defeated the dragon way back there. One day Jesus is going to come back and defeat the dragon. In Revelation 20, he's going to bind the dragon and cast him into the abyss. He will be the greater Michael than the one back there in Revelation and chapter 12. She was 2,000 years premature as she scrabbled for political supremacy. What a shocking thing, brothers and sisters, that was. Well, division occurs in the ranks. Our brothers and sisters and the Protestants are going to have nothing to do with this woman, this Catholic system, and so they run away. They're compelled to flee in exile because Constantine is after them. So we read in Revelation and chapter 12 and these words, verse 6. And the woman fled into... How are you doing? Are you as tired as me? Are you? Yeah, okay. Stay with us. Stay with us. Stay with us for the next few minutes. Do not check out. All right. Take your breath. Shake your head. Don't empty everything out of your head that we just talked about. You ready to focus? All right. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Brothers and sisters, one thousand two hundred and sixty years. When did she flee? She fled in three hundred and twelve. In those first three years, while Constantine was trying to find out who his mum was, in those first three years, there were all these controversies. There was the African controversy, you may have heard of that, where there was fighting and infighting between the bishops in the Catholic Church in North Africa. And they were appealing to Constantine to sort the issues out. That was the beginning, that was the beginning of the woman ready to peel off So she began to run in 312 and she ran and sought refuge for 1260 years. You add those two together, brothers and sisters, and you have 1572. Does anybody know what happened in 1572? One of the milestones of of history. Absolutely. Well done, Stan. I would have expected nothing less. The Massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day, where the Catholics slew 71,000 witnesses in three months. 71,000. And what was the response of the Catholics? They minted a coin. And Pope Gregory XIII, on his coin, had the slaying of the Huguenots and they said, let's have a party because we've slain these witnesses, these protestors. So she runs away. And therefore, brothers and sisters, there we are in Revelation chapter 11. Now, I'm not going to go through Revelation 11 at all in any detail. What I want to do, if you're with us, you can, you're good, you're Texans. You Texans can handle anything, so stay with us. I want to show you the relationship very briefly between chapter 11 and chapter 12. Remember in chapter 12, she runs and she's fed for 1,260 years, a day for a year principle. That's Revelation 12 and verse 6. In Revelation 11, we talk about in verses 3 through to 7, two witnesses. Witnesses? These two witnesses in Revelation 11 are called my two witnesses, the two lampstands, the two olive trees and these two prophets. Who are these two witnesses of chapter 11? They are political and religious anti-papal witnesses. 
political witnesses on one, they are not the brothers and sisters. Do not confuse this. These are not the brothers and sisters in Christ. The brothers and sisters in Christ are there in the first two verses. We're not going to go there. These are anti-Catholic in their political and religious manifestations right through 1,500 years or so of history. Now, what's the connection? Well, they speak out in verse 3 for 1,260 days. When do they start speaking? Right there in Revelation 12. They begin their protesting, they begin their speaking out in 3.12. So if you note in your margin, they begin to prophesy and it's connected right back there when the woman flees. They are, it's exactly the same event. And they speak out for 1,260 days and they are killed in that awful massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day in 1572. And when they shall have finished their witnessing, their testimony, the beast, the Catholic system, shall ascend out of the abyss and make war against the two witnesses who began in 312 and shall overcome them and kill them. What an amazing thing. Oh, if only we had time to go through that. We're going to go through that with the young people this afternoon, actually at 3 o'clock. We're going to go through the time periods and that's one of them we're going to go through. And they requested that class, by the way, which is so, so very encouraging. All right, brothers and sisters, now let's have a look at it. We draw our study to a conclusion. We've got a couple of minutes to go. That's fine. We're on track. If, you, if your head's killing you, there's nothing I can do about that because I'm not a medical practitioner. <laughs> All right, now let's see if we can summarise it. The two witnesses of Revelation 11, verses 3 through 4, started when the woman fled in Revelation 12. Make sense? 312, 1260, 1572. Now, when you go to Revelation 12 and verse 15, the woman's run away. The remnant of her seed, the brothers and sisters, have run with her. But someone else pops up in the scene called the earth. So, the serpent, who was now the Christian dragon, Constantine, then his sons, then the Christian emperors ruling from Constantinople, the serpent cast out of his mouth a great flood, judgment. And it was to be after the woman that he might carry the woman away with the flood. And here are the Christians running away. And in the first instance, they were the Donatists of North Africa. And they're running away. And all of a sudden, they're running away, trying to flee from this dragon, this Christian dragon. This earth opens up its mouth and swallows the flood. There's someone called the earth that helps the woman. Well, let's have a look at that very, very quickly. Can't do that. No time. Time's our enemy. Don't look at that. Here it is. Here we are, brothers and sisters, the serpent cast out of his mouth, water as a flood. There's the Christian dragon, and this great flood came. Well, a flood, of course, is judgment. Isaiah 8 and verse 7 proves that, as does Jeremiah 46 and verse 7 through 8. But someone called the earth opens its mouth and swallows the flood. Who was the earth? Well, very briefly, brothers and sisters, they were a bunch of people in North Africa who were called the Circumcellions. Political witnesses, helping the religious witnesses. That's Revelation 11. My two witnesses who would begin in 312 and continue all the way through history. And these circumcellions were these big blokes that used to walk around carrying clubs. And they would not be shackled with anything Romish. And they would fight with a passion that almost defied the imagination of man. They would fight the Catholics. And in the process, they would help the woman. What an amazing thing, brothers and sisters. Well, we can, can we, we, <laughs> I'm so tired I don't even know what word I want to use. We'll now conclude our class with this, with this statement from a 4th century Bible student. Look at this. You reckon this doesn't give you chills? It does me, let me tell you. Here we are in that context where the woman flees. And this is taken from Eureka, volume 4, page 147. This is a Donatist writer, one of the religious witnesses in North Africa. Behold, he says, suddenly the polluted flood. That's Revelation 12. A flood out of the mouth of the dragon. Behold, he says, the polluted flood of the Macarian persecution burst forth from the tyrannical church of King Constance, Constantine's son. And two beasts, two men, were sent to Africa from thence to wit Macarius and Paulus. A most horrible and cruel ecclesiastical war was proclaimed that a Christian people should be compelled 
by the naked swords of soldiers. Now listen to this, by the standards of serpents or dragons. That's Revelation 12. That's the language of Revelation 12. And they want us, by the blasting of trumpets, they want us to unite with traitor tours. Brothers and sisters, a traitor tour is a word from which we get the word traitor. And they trade their books. They trade anything for their life. They've done it in the past. And what we're being told there, brothers and sisters, our brethren and sisters would not trade anything for their life in Christ Jesus. What an astounding thing. What a wonderful thing it is for us to be able to pick up books like Revelation 12 and read that history and see the angels diligently at work, brothers and sisters. Well, God willing, in our next class tomorrow, we're going to now see God's punishment on the Christian empire that has now emerged, having gone away from the pagan empire. And our next session will be called The Seven Angels, which have the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound as we go in to Revelation chapter 8. Thank you, brothers and sisters.